Hey guys, this is Mr. Shear. Today we're going to be learning about the Spanish conquistadors a little bit and looking at some documents and really working on the historical process as we do so. And we're also going to talk a little bit about some short answer questions at the end and give you the opportunity to try one of those. So we'll get right into it today. I'm going to share my screen out with you here and we'll get started. So we're talking Spanish conquistadors and we're using documents to analyze this and it's learning how to work through some primary and secondary documents here as well. So just a little bit of introduction for our conquistadors. You guys know this story because you've heard it before, and so we don't really have to spend a whole lot of time with this. I'd rather spend the time with the documents today. So we're talking about our Cortez, we're talking about Pizarro's, we're talking about our Cabal, and all these other guys. You know their names, you know who they are, and you know kind of what they've done as well. Most of their voyages go more to the mainland. These are Central and South American voyages. And so that's going to make a difference in a lot of the things that happen there. Here again, there is a much greater emphasis on the exploitation of resources. And they're also gonna be looking at more permanent settlement uh, under the Encomienda system. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But the goals here are probably at least um, from Columbus's first voyages that are very, very different than what, what took place uh, with Columbus. So different kind of motivations means different results in the end. And I think you guys know how that goes. So we're gonna look at a couple different sources today. First, we're gonna look at um, Hernan Cortez's um, first letter to King Charles I of Spain. It's written in 1519 as he gives an accounting of his, um, his journeyings. And then we're also going to look at a, another document from Bartolomo de, de, la, de la Casas, who is um, a contemporary, I think I mentioned before, that he actually was a contemporary of Columbus. And, but he's more known for his time that he spends in the, in the Spanish colonies in the New World and his experience there seeing things like um, what Cortez and others did. So we're looking at both of those. And we're going to start with Cortez. but to to really analyze the documents today, we need to review something about sourcing. You know this from your AP class last year and the importance of sourcing and what that means, but sourcing is all about finding all the information we need about the document. I don't know what kind of acronym or anything else that your teachers last year used, but in my class, we will use the HIPPO method. One, because hippos are just adorable animals but secondly, because it makes more sense to me. I like this, uh, this acronym better. So when we are trying to find the information or source a document, we're trying to find all of the info, info that's gonna help us understand and analyze that document. So the HIPPO method involves uh, four main parts, five part, parts in total. First off, um, it's going to have us find the historical context. Now, all of the documents that we're going to look at today, we already have the context for because we just talked about it. We know what's been happening. And we'll, we'll just mention that briefly. Also, we're going to look at intended audience. That's I, intended audience. P is the perspective or point of view of the author. And that doesn't quite mean what most people think it does. Uh, the other P is purpose, the purpose of the document and the author's purpose in writing or creating the document. And then finally, O is any other outside information that's not in the document that would help give us more understanding about what's going on inside the document. Usually that's kind of sort of like the extra. We're not going to spend very much time with that because it's kind of sort of an oddball, kind of whatever else will help you understand the document sort of thing. And if, if you don't put the O, it just spells it, which is not cool. So historical context is, context is exactly what you think it is. It's the events and circumstances that surround that document that are necessary for us to understand how this document fits into the larger historical narrative. So anything that happens that gives us kind of an idea what's going on to, to understand why this document's been written um, and, or anything else like that, that's our historical context. Usually it tells us why the document is created. If you know the context, if you know everything else that's happening, you pretty much can figure out why this document is being written or created. So context is usually, um, it's pretty easy to understand what it is. Sometimes it's a little bit harder to understand how to find it or what counts as context, but more on that another time. We're talking about intended audience as well. Intended audience is who is meant to re read or see the document. That's pretty, audience is pretty easy to understand, right? 
But really what we're looking for here is something more specific because we have a tendency to, to, to default right to the most general answers. Who's the audience? The American people, okay? Who's the audience? Uh, the government, okay? We use a lot of general terms. And if we want a really good, rich, intended audience, we dig deeper and we understand that usually a document is meant for somebody more specific than just the American people, okay? Uh, usually there's a whole lot more there. So when we look for an intended audience, we want something more specific. How can we narrow that? Secondly, we're looking for uh, the difference between a primary audience and a secondary audience. Primary audience is the very obvious intended audience. The one that's easy to see on the surface. Sometimes it's in the title of the document. Sometimes it's just very obvious to say, okay, here's who they're trying to speak to. But a lot of times it's not the best or the juiciest audience. Sometimes there's a better audience to dig for in there. Those are sometimes the secondary audiences. Secondary audiences are often implied and not stated in the document or in the titles. It may not seem like it's directed to those people, but when in actuality, it really is. Secondary audiences are a lot more fun to find because that sometimes tells us what the author's real true purpose is. And it's a little bit more of a challenge to unearth them, but it's much, much, much better to be able to find those secondary audiences because it can be a lot more revealing. Those are the kind that I want you to really look for. Primary audience is important, and sometimes that's, that's going to help us understand the document better, but so, a lot of times those secondary audiences give us more insight into the document. Third is point of view and perspective, and this is one people screw up all the time because they think, oh, the point of view of the author, that's his opinion. That's not what we're talking about when we're sourcing a document. When we're talking about point of view or perspective of the document, we're looking at something a little bit different. This is how the author's background, such as their gender, their race, their socioeconomic status, their position, their, uh, their politics, their experiences, all of those things, how that affects what they write and how it affects what their, their perspective is. Um, I like to think of it as what is, the larger, what is the larger group in society that they're representing? So um, what other kind of people, what type of people do they represent in their point of view? So for example, um, and by the way, this is not, 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 not their opinion. That is not what we mean. Point of view means where are they coming from? Who, what angle are they taking here? So for example, a, a point of view, a perspective, a point of view of an author is not, he's against slavery. No, his point of view is, well, as a northerner and as a, as a fervent abolitionist who grew up in the household of William Sumner, this person, okay, that's the perspective. What's their background that gives them some kind of unique angle? right? Not, 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 not their opinion. It doesn't mean, oh, well, they hate slavery. Yeah, the, okay, we probably got that from reading the, 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 reading the, the article or reading the document. But what we're trying to figure out is what perspective or what angle are they coming from? Are they come, okay, so they're um, a uh, English colonist who was sent there to escape religious persecution, so that's going to affect the way that they maybe see other, okay, that's what we're getting at, right? Finally, the other P is purpose. Purpose seems pretty obvious. Why is the author written or created this? What are they trying to accomplish? But per finding purpose is sometimes a little bit more difficult because in many cases, their true purpose is not the same as their stated purpose. So for example, you read a document like, oh, clearly what they're trying to do is this, but that's not what they say. Or sometimes you read it and you're like, oh, they must be trying to do this when in, other, in, a, in actuality, they have some kind of other agenda that they're trying to accomplish. The real key in finding purpose is looking for the not so obvious because often there is a d deeper purpose than what it first appears to be. Sometimes there's a lot more specific or detailed of a purpose than it looks like on the surface. So really digging there is, is what you want to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to try this out a little bit. I want you to, and I've included this in our, there's a primary source document packet that I've included with this presentation. I think I've called it um, conquistador documents or something like that. Uh, what you want to do is I want you to find in that packet, and it's not the first one, I don't think. I think it, the, the, the Lacasas is, is first, but you go, go through, it's like page three or four, and find Cortez's first letter. Let's start, um, at the top of the page, it should say the evidence, European accounts. And read Cortez's first letter. It's actually an excerpt, but read the, those excerpts, okay? When you're finished, what you're going to do is you're going to determine what is the intended audience? And remember to consider any secondary audiences. What is the perspective? And then what is the purpose? And again, remember what we talked about. 
Don't just take everything at face value. Look a little bit deeper and see if you can figure out uh, what we're looking at there. So we're going to take a break now. Go read it. It'll take you a few. It's going to take you a few minutes. It'll also take you a few minutes, and then we'll, we'll we'll pop up here the questions so you can answer intended audience perspective and purpose. Okay, let's compare notes. Let's compare what we've got here. So as we're sourcing Cortez, there's Cortez looking very fancy there. Uh, when we talk about intended audience, there's a pretty stinking obvious intended audience there because it's in the title. So first, you probably ought to be able to identify King Charles as being the intended audience. But what secondary audiences did you come up with? Were you able to find some other ones? These, this is where it kind of gets really interesting because when you find those secondary audiences, it starts to give you a little bit more insight into why the document is the way that it is. Um, I think you can definitely make a strong argument that priests, religious leaders, um, particularly those that might be in the new world would be a, a good audience for this. Think about the way that he's writing it and how much of a religious appeal he is making. There are probably a number of priests and religious leaders in the, in the new world that have been very, very critical of his policies and the way that he's gone about things because we know how these conquistadors went about their business. So maybe he's trying to abate some of that criticism and maybe they're kind of a secondary audience uh, for that reason is they've been critical and so he wants to kind of justify some of those actions. Similarly, what about the Spanish people? Maybe Cortez here and this information could probably eventually get leaked in those directions. Maybe this, he wants to try to preserve some of his legacy. If people are saying bad things about what he's doing, maybe again, he's trying to kind of paint the picture a little bit, paint his legacy a little bit, so that he is remembered a little bit better than, well, how we actually come to remember the King Charles of Spain. So, uh, King Charles of Spain, obviously and clearly the intended audience, but I think Cortez knows that it's not just gonna be King Charles that gets word of what's, what he's saying here, and so, Think about those other ripple effects that could be involved. When we talk about perspective, where is Cortez coming from? What did you think of there? Well, probably one of the most important things is, and you saw this all the way through the document, he's got this cultural superiority, this European, we are more civilized kind of deal going on, right? I mean, that's all smack dab all over that, that thing. So that perspective is obviously very important in, in the way this document is read. Think also of his, his, and there's some superiority in this, but his Christian background, how that colors this document, and his religious beliefs, and how that's tied into the way he interprets everything that's going on. Obviously, that's crucial to the way that he writes. So those are two good examples of how perspective paints how that document comes out. Finally, purpose. What do you think the purpose is here? And by the way, um, there's, there's some really good things in here if you dig a little bit. So maybe on the surface, you're saying, okay, well, his purpose is to kind of give an update to the king, right? Obvious, and that's right on the surface. But if that's where you end it. I think you're missing really what's, what this document is about, and you're not really sourcing it to the depth we need, okay? So yes, he's giving an accounting to the king, but what is he really, why is he really doing it? Why does he write this the way that he does? Well, I think for one, he's trying to justify those actions, and we mentioned that already. Chances are that word has already gotten back about how things are going there um, and how he's running things in the new world. Perhaps some of it hasn't been very favorable. And so he's trying to explain himself, get himself out of trouble kind of deal and gain favor again with the king and probably can perhaps gain favor with, like we talked about other priests, religious leaders that might be condemning him so that he continues to get the, the, the rope that he has there, you know, so he continues to, to be able to do what he's doing. So I think that's a big part of it. And maybe even to take it one step further, who signs the check? Who gives him the troops? Who gives him the authority? Who gives him everything? He may very well be trying to also keep in mind that if he cuts off and it angers the king, then there goes the money, there goes the troops, there goes everything that he needs, the resources he needs to continue about his conquest. So at the same time, he's probably trying to gain the favor of the king and say, hey, Cortez is doing some pretty good things there. We need to invest a little bit more heavily in what he's doing. So there's some, some differing purposes there that maybe just aren't quite on the surface. 
That's what sourcing a document's about. Look at the layers there, like an onion, okay? There's so many layers because it's not just one audience, there are others. It's not just one perspective. It's not just one purpose. There's a lot more beneath what might be readily available on the surface and it kind of helps us understand the document. So I consider this. I want you to answer these two questions and we're gonna take, take pause here so that you can do that. How do you think the intended audience impacts this document? Why does it matter who is the audience and, and think about secondary audiences, why does that matter and how does that impact what's, what's written in the document? The second one is, how might that intended audience, or at any time in this document or any argument, how might intended audience and purpose be related? So in this document, how do you think intended audience relates to the purpose? Okay, take a minute. These are the kinds of questions with sourcing that are really important because all of this sourcing, the reason we're doing it, the reason we, and you'll need this for DBQs, you need this for everything, when you look at a document, there's so much more that impacts the way that document is and what bias is there and all those kinds of things. So when you think about intended audience, know that that shapes what, what the author is writing. You tailor your message to the audience. And so in this case, writing to the king, the person who has the ability to make some very important decisions matters, okay? And also, intended audience and purpose are almost always connected. Intended audience and purpose are just are almost married because who what your purpose is is usually I mean that your audience matters right so if the audience is the king that you're talking to the king for a reason he has the authority to be able to make some 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 changes that you can't separate audience and purpose in many cases so they're 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 in, almost inseparable in that way okay so. How come we're not advancing here? There we go. So let's look at the De La, Cas De La, De La Casas passage. I lost an S there somewhere. Um, I want you to read the excerpt. And again, we're going to do the same thing. Determine intended audience, perspective, and purpose. And I think you'll find that there's some different things in there. So take a minute. And it'll actually probably more than a minute because the De La Casas passage is a lot longer. Well, not a lot longer, but it's longer. And then we'll go back and look at the intended audience perspective and purpose. Go ahead. Okay, you probably came up with some different answers this time and, and, and probably rightfully so. So with De Los, De Los Casas, we've got the obvious intended audience, if you read the introduction is right there. He's writing to the politicians and uh, monarchical advisors, advisors to the king because there's quite a bit of debate on, in Spain over what the best way to deal with in the, the natives is and what's right and what's wrong. And so he's writing to convince them and that's stated, but I don't think that's it. I think he knows that these words will go other places. So what secondary audiences did you come up with? Well, probably and possibly other explorers because there's in his mind a right way and a wrong way to, to go about this. And so hopefully he's, or he might be hopeful that his words might convince others that are going to come after Cortez that there's, there's other ways to do this and other ways to approach this. Furthermore, he might be also be speaking to other religious leaders because um, he might be trying to convince them to withdraw their support of this kind of conquest and to, and to understand the way that uh, the Spanish conquest has gone in, in the Americas and that there needs to be a change and they need to withdraw some of that support maybe uh, to, to perpetuate that change. So I think that there are some other important audiences. Definitely the intended, the first primary audience in this one is hugely important because that, that is probably most linked to his purpose. When we come from perspective, think about this, and you probably read this if you read the beginning part again. This is a friar, a priest, and a religious leader. So he's thinking about this probably completely different than somebody that's primarily motivated by accumulating wealth. So his perspective is definitely very different in that, and you can see that all the way through. He's also somebody who has lived in the colonies most of his life, in the Spanish settlements all his life. He's grown up, and he has seen these atrocities firsthand. He has... Um, He's lived, he's never, and to his adult life, never been back in, in Spain for any extended amount of time. So he is essentially American in a, in, a, in a way. And as a Spanish colonizer, 
he's thinking about this differently than somebody like a conquistador, even a king who's in Spain or has lived in Spain all their life and are just dealing with this issue from afar. And I think that's an important perspective as well. Now, purpose is where it gets interesting because there are, there, the, the key important purpose definitely is probably try to help preserve the native peoples because as he writes this, the intended audience being politicians um, and those advisors of the king, he wants to, he wants there to be change. He wants to help save the, the native peoples. And I think that, that that's a pure intention of his. And I think that's there. But I do think that there's probably some other things because look at him. He is a priest, a friar, and religious leader in the Americas. So obviously at the same time, he's probably hoping that the king and religious leaders are going to get behind him so that they'll give La Casas the opportunity to, to gain maybe more land, land grants, um, support money to, to open missions and to uh, help convert the Indians and kind of support his endeavor as well, right? Just like Cortez was writing in, 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 so, in to try to get the, the favor of the king. I don't think this is any different. I think it, to some degree, that Las Casas is also courting some of that support. And furthermore, he, I mean, and this is kind of related, he, his purpose is to expand the work of his ministry. And he wants to see more converts on, on the on the American lands. And so he's writing because he knows that the king and, and, and those in power have the ability to make that a little bit easier on him. So the sourcing deal is kind of interesting because it really gives us the depth of, of understanding that we need to really pick apart a source. And both of those sources were very informative. We kind of get the perspective of the, um, uh, uh, the conquistador, which is sort of interesting, but not really unsurprising. And then we get the Las Casas, the Las Casas st story, which is, is really what we've come to know is the, the, the deal with the conquistadors. And it's kind of a no holds barred, nothing left back sort of perspective that, that really helps us kind of get an idea of what maybe Cortez was hoping to, to sort of slide over. I don't know that he was. I think he's more kind of just trying to justify the truth than anything. So uh, what I want you to do is you're going to take a pause right here. I'm going to put insert a pause. There's a video that I've also put inside this assignment uh, from the documentary Guns, Germs, and Steel, which was originally a historical work. And this little excerpt kind of describes some of this conquistador business, really puts an image to that, and I think will help. And then we'll come back here and, and discuss it. Okay. Okay. And again, nothing there that you don't know. I, I don't think so. I, that, that just kind of puts a visual to it. Uh, but, and maybe it's even some reality to that and to what we're talking about when we talk about this conquest and how quickly it happens. The reason uh, for this dominance is, is really threefold. Number one, natives really honestly and truly believed because of their spiritual traditions uh, that these, in many cases, were white gods that were coming to uh, to redeem their people. And because of that preconceived idea, that makes this religious dominance, or this, this dominance based on religious principles, so easy for the Spanish that they walk in there. Um, they're, they're, the peoples are already receiving them with humility, and that gives them, that kind of grants them some power up front that gives them an upper hand right from the start. So that there's that. Uh, obviously, superior weaponry in this case, you know, guns makes the difference, hence the name guns, germs, and steel. And there's the, the germs part, disease. And we know how that works. We know the story with that. There's actually, if you look in there, and I don't know, is that, that on here? No, I didn't. But um, there's actually, there was a graph, I think it's, I don't know where it is in your packet, but there's a, there's a, a page in there in that, in that um, source document the chart on the bottom right hand corner is amazing. It is fascinating and terrible all at once. It shows the decline of native population and the increase of um, non-native population. And just it's staggering at what that population chart shows. And that is primarily due to disease for which they didn't have immunity. So um, you got that whole deal. And that makes, that really explains this quick and sweeping dominance. Probably the disease more than anything explains that, that, that quick and easy dominance. And so you see the start of real, actual Spanish settlement in the new land in the form of encomiendas. 
Encomiendas are like labor farms, Spanish uh, land grants that the king is given charters almost, and he gives a plot of land, and that encomienda includes everything on it, including the native. So if they're natives living on that land, they now belong to you as part of your encomienda system. Now, the, the, the chart here on the right kind of helps to give, gives you the idea. Uh, they thought this, and they explained that this was going to help both uh, European settlers and Indians, but uh, that's not the way it works out. So the plan is Spanish settlers will protect and care for and Christianize the Indians on their land. And the Indians would work a portion of their time for Spanish settlers and everybody would be happy. Reality is very much different. Spanish settlers force long labor. They don't pay the Indian workers. They fail to protect the Indians and seize Indian lands. And as you know, more than more often than not, the Indians die from disease and harsh living conditions or working conditions. And um, this lasts for a very long time until Indians rebel. And you know, there was some effect of people like De De Las Casas and, and what they've got going on too. So this is the beginning of settlement. This is the first pattern of settlement in the new world. And I, it is what it is, right? We know, we know what's going on, but this is going to set some patterns that will be continued later so it's kind of important to note conquistadors okay so let's take this somewhere else and, and and work with it a little bit in the form of short answer questions yay if you remember from your sojourns through world history you are already probably short answer question or saq experts but they can be a very important part of the uh the a push test and an opportunity for you really to pick up some points if you know some of the tips and tricks. So keep this in mind. A short answer question is not a question at all. It's three questions. It's they're cheating when they call it a short answer question because it's really a three part question. And though the parts are related, you should treat them as if they are three completely and entirely different questions. That will guarantee that you give enough information to answer them. It will help probably also guarantee, well, that won't guarantee, but it will help you make sure that you put them in the right format as well. Because I want you to answer them. Anytime you answer them, whether you're doing it on a computer or whether you're doing it by hand or whoever you, or however you're doing it, you should label each question with its corresponding letter. So they will have the question and they'll say, A, question, and then ask the question. On your answer sheet, it should say, A, parenthesis, and then your answer, okay? It should not be a game for the AP grader of, ooh, hide and go seek with your answer, okay? It should be clearly labeled. And every time, so you answer A, and then when you write a, a, the answer to part B, or you're going to part B, new question, right? Kind of new question. New line, B, parenthesis, answer. Finish that one, okay? I'm gonna answer part three, or the third question, C, new line, C, zoom. That makes it easy to understand what part of the question you're trying to answer and also makes it easy for the, the reader to read, okay? It'll help you organize it as well. Please keep in mind, short answer questions are indeed supposed to be short. You answer the question and you get out, okay? But you need to use complete sentences and you can't just use bullet points. You have to speak in sentences. So you do have to write things out. Is there a good answer for how many sentences it should be? And no, three or four is probably the range, two, three, four, it just kind of depends on the question because sometimes SAQs are very different. If you're writing one, it's probably too short. If you're falling into multiple paragraphs, it's probably too long, okay? So how do you do it? How do you answer the question? Very easy, use the ACE method. Again, I don't know if this is, we're learning lots of acronyms today, HIPPO, ACE, but use the ACE method, A-C-E, okay? So first, you're going to answer the question, duh, okay, right? It asks some kind of question, you need to answer that part of the question. You must provide that answer. But secondly, and probably most importantly, once you answer, you need to be able to back it up. So you need some kind of example to back it up. So answer the question and give some evidence. Yes, this is true, here's why it's true. That's really what makes your, your SAQ work or happen. If you can't justify your answer, you can't explain that part of the answer with evidence, then it's probably going to be pretty tough to get credit for it. Finally, the last part of ACE is E, explain your answer. 
Sometimes if you do A and C, you probably don't need to also, like your, your, your explanation of your answer may not necessarily, you might not have to do it, okay? But more often than not, you need another sentence or two to kind of tie everything back together or to explain how your evidence directly relates to your answer. Um, nothing is too obvious in a short answer question. You can't say, well, obviously. This is, no, say it. Don't leave anything unsaid or implied. Just say it, okay? Like, and so this is why this, uh, you know, this proves this. It's better to say it than not, okay? Because that way you know you get the question. So you can ace each part. You go through A, answer it, cite it, explain your answer. You answer part B, answer the question, cite an example, explain your answer. C, and then you do all three parts. And one thing that is important to notice, note, and I should have said this before, SAQ is not do A or B or C. And SAQ is do A, B, and C. You have to do all three parts, and you have to go all the way through the ACE method. You've got to explain it and answer it and cite it through each question as well, okay? I know that that was quick, but I want you to try your hand at it, and then we can kind of get some feedback. So there's an SAQ assignment in Google Classroom. I've given you a, a prompt. It has all three parts, A, B, C. I want you to answer right there on the Google Doc. Don't forget to label them. A, here's my answer. B, here's my answer. C, here's my answer. Use complete sentences. And once you're finished, remember to hit turn in on the assignment page. And then we'll kind of get a look at how you're doing your SAQs and if you're giving enough information, if you're doing a good job of citing with evidence and how you're approaching that, okay? So that's your assignment for today. Conquistadors, a little bit about sourcing and a little bit about SAQs and you've learned quite a bit. So have a great day of it. Enjoy writing your SAQ and we'll come back with it tomorrow.